Hi class, welcome to Ecology Lesson 8. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to compare and contrast primary and secondary succession. Describe how competition for limited resources contributes to ecological succession and understand how humans and nature interact and change ecosystems. Make sure you're taking notes, following along, and let's get started. Let's start by looking at this picture of a forest fire. We know this ecosystem will be devastated after this fire rips through it. Many organisms will lose their habitats. The nutrients will change and the communities will look very different. But what do you think this will look like in 50 years? Will the same community of organisms be able to live there? Will the plants and animals that inhabit this area in 50 years look similar to the ones that did before the fire? The answer to this question can be solved with ecological succession. Ecological succession is a gradual change in the communities that live in an ecosystem. This change happens after a disturbance, either natural or man-made. The disturbance could be fire or volcanic eruption, could also be deforestation or the rerouting of water due to a dam or a flood. The first species that will inhabit an area after a great disturbance is called the pioneer species. Moss and lichen are common pioneer species because they do not have extensive root systems and they reproduce by spores. Spores are really lightweight and can easily be transported to an area. Another common pioneer species is grass. In the city, we often see grass growing up through the cracks of the sidewalk where no grass grew before. That's because grass, again, is best suited to live in the harsh environment. But as the organisms go and live and undergo life cycles, they can change the abiotic factors. As they die and decompose, they can create soil. The change in abiotic factors allows for a change in the biotic factors or the communities that live there. When ecological succession occurs, the gradual change always starts with a pioneer species, and it usually ends with a climax community or a group of organisms best suited for survival in the environmental conditions present. So the basic sequence of events happens after a disturbance which wipes out most of the biotic community and drastically changes the abiotic community. The pioneer species will come in and these pioneers are producers. And as these producers live and thrive, what they'll do is as they die, they will be able to make soil. Soil is an abiotic factor. As the abiotic factors slowly change, so do the types of communities that the environment can support. So typically, we change from mosses to grasses to shrubs to small trees and then to taller trees until we finally have a climax community which are the organisms we usually des describe within an ecosystem. There are two different types of succession. There's primary succession, which is characterized by the gradual change in living organisms in an area that never had life before, like when a volcanic island forms in the middle of the ocean. And there is secondary succession, where a community existed but was changed due to a disturbance and it slowly changes over time after that disturbance. Let's watch a video so that we can make sure we clearly understand the difference between 
primary succession and secondary succession. Here's the difference between primary and secondary succession. In primary ecological succession, the ecosystem must rebuild after being completely destroyed to the point where even the soil is gone. Whereas, in secondary ecological succession, the ecosystem rebuilds when the soil is still intact. So the main difference between these two types of ecological succession is the presence of soil in the beginning of the process of succession. In fact, the main feature of primary ecological, ecological succession is soil formation. So primary ecological succession can occur on a newly formed volcanic island or on a rock exposed from a receding glacier. Those are just two random examples. And the first organisms to colonize the area are called pioneer organisms. This makes sense. Pioneers are the first types of people to colonize an area, so pioneer organisms are the first organisms to colonize a destroyed land or a newly formed land. So these pioneer organisms are generally mosses and lichens. And we talked about how they are spore-bearing plants because spores are light and easier to carry over by the wind. And so these pioneer organisms, particularly lichen, has a special feature that helps the process of soil formation. And lichens are able to secrete toxins into the rocks and break them down into soil. So this is one of the first steps of soil formation. Soil formation can also occur over time through the wearing down of the rocks by weather and by water. The third type of soil formation is when the mosses and lichens die and their biomass is degrade, uh, degrades into soil. So these are the three different things that contribute to soil. Um, secondary ecological succession can occur after a small forest fire or after a log company clears a piece of land. So this doesn't exactly look like a small forest fire, but let's pretend this is a small forest fire. And when this fire burns down the trees, it still keeps the soil intact. So then it doesn't have to go through the all the processes that primary succession does for soil formation. So it is it doesn't have any pioneer organisms because there are already organisms within the soil and around the soil that have um, that are residues from the old ecosystem. And depending on how bad or um, how much is left of the old ecosystem, the um, secondary ecological succession can just start in the middle of succession and then grow from there into the final climax community. So remember, the main difference between primary and secondary ecological succession is the soil formation in primary ecological succession. Although the starting community in the two types of succession may be different, the thing that they share in common is these are gradual changes that happen over a long period of time. The example to the left shows you what happens in an unattended city block as slowly grasses and shrubs take over the environment. If given enough time, trees will even grow in this area. On the right is a picture of ecological succession that began with the volcanic eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980. The volcanic eruption disrupted and killed almost all life in the area, but slowly over time, the communities changed. They competed for the limiting resources like soil, water, and air, until a new climax community was established. Now let's watch a fun Amoeba Sisters video that reviews the important details of ecological succession. So we love Disney movies and we have to say, Lion King is one of our favorites. And like a lot of Disney movies, it has a happy ending. 
And we're not going to give spoilers, just in case you're one of the few people left in the world that hasn't seen The Lion King. If so, you need to go see it. Anyway, with that happy ending that we do love, you start to see all this life growing back at the end of The Lion King. The sun comes out, all these plants start growing, happy music plays. There were animals that had disappeared, and they come back. I never really understood where they went, but they come back. You start seeing these small plants growing in where there hadn't been any plants for a while. And being a biology teacher, everything is destined to have a biology reference. So here's what it reminds me of. Ecological succession. Although the movie is kind of like an ultra-fast, impossible ecological succession. It's not really that fast in real life. Most dictionaries define succession as the following of a person or a thing after another in an order or a sequence. Well, ecological succession, it's that. But in terms of ecology, ecological succession is a process over time of organisms in an ecological community. So what's a community? Well, in ecology, we have different levels of organization. We have a living organism as our first level, like a hippo. And then we have a population, which is when you have the same species of an organism in a given area. So, for example, a population of hippos. Same species, so that's one population. And then we have a community. A community can involve many populations living together in an area. So now we have hippos, lions, giraffes, and don't forget plants, because they can be a population too. Trees and shrubs. Now, there are more levels beyond the community level, but this is our focus right now. Now, there are two types of succession that we're going to briefly talk about. One is called primary succession. In primary succession, the area that this is happening to is brand new, at least in the sense that you're usually talking about an area that it doesn't have any soil. So this usually has to be a special circumstance. An example could be a volcano lava flow that now has left this new area with no soil present. And usually you have a pioneer species, which that's the name for species that will colonize the area first. It sounds kind of exciting. Pioneer species and primary succession. Well, they can be organisms like lichen. If you're unsure about what lichen is, you need to Google it. It's likely you've seen lichen before. Moss is another potential pioneer. After pioneer species colonize the area, they slowly break down rock into smaller, more plant-friendly substrate, and over time they can contribute more organic matter in this newly formed soil, which will help support all kinds of plants. Small vascular plants like grasses and plants that you might consider weeds, those will come in, and shrubs can follow, and then trees. All this time, animals can be moving into the area, and how long this takes, it can vary. It's often hundreds of years before you get your full climax community going. And if you're wondering, why this sequence with the plants? Why doesn't it just stop with the grass? Well, keep in mind that as other plants come in, these bigger plants, you're going to start to see more competition for space and resources. I mean, think about how it would be by the time trees come in. As the trees grow larger, they could block some of the light that small plants underneath them might be dependent on. And as new larger plant species come in, this competition can bring about a new order. And if you're wondering, where did these plants even come from? Well, there's so many ways that seeds can be dispersed. Wind, water, animals. Check out our plant reproduction video for more information about how these plants could actually have come into the area. Now for secondary succession. Similar to primary succession, it follows a typical ecological sequence. With secondary succession, I like to think second, because it's like coming back again a second time. And what I mean by that is it's usually you're talking about an area that once had plants and animals and a full ecological community going on, but then you had a disturbance, an ecological disturbance, like a forest fire or a flood, a tornado. Actually, it doesn't even have to be a natural disaster. Human activity can be involved with secondary succession too. Regardless of the type of event, in secondary succession, the soil is still there. And so that's kind of a big key point here because you actually have soil to grow in. So you don't have to have this really hardy pioneer species because in secondary succession, your first species there might be small plants. There's already soil present. 
Secondary succession will then follow a similar sequence to primary succession after that point. Since secondary succession involves soil already being available, it's much more likely to be a faster process than primary succession. An important thing to remember about ecological succession is that it really shows diversity of organisms in an ecological community over a period of time, and usually it's a long period of time. Ecological succession over time can support an ecological community that continues to increase in biodiversity, and biodiversity is a beautiful thing. This concludes lesson number eight. Remember that ecosystems are constantly undergoing natural change. Ecosystems are dynamic and can be altered by nature or humans. Altering ecosystems can positively and negatively affect biodiversity. Biodiversity ensures that ecosystems can survive in a changing environment. Make sure you've taken good notes. Post your notes on Google Classroom and complete your Google form. I hope to see you in office hours soon.